Sorry to take a little extra time, but I'm trying to get some more of these things together to say them the way I think they need to be said. Let's come to another little division in this study of Christian liberty, where we begin stating the purposes of Christian liberty, the purposes for Christian liberty, which will take us I don't know how long, so we'll wait and see. First of all, the purposes of liberty negatively stated. In other words, what liberty is not for. And then we can answer positively, why do we have liberty? <coughs> so to begin with, and we've got several different purposes here, under the negative aspect, that is negatively stating why we have Christian liberty. Number one, our Christian liberty is not to sin. All things are lawful unto me. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 and 10, 23. All things are lawful, but obviously Paul does not mean that sin is lawful. We have Christian liberty, but our liberty is not a license to sin. Or to say it another way, Christian liberty always resists license. That's Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 to begin with, anyway. Verse 13. We need the first two parts of the verse, A and B. You might want to see this passage. We've got several to look at similar to this. Galatians 5. 13 a and b liberty christian liberty resists license christian liberty is not antinomianism for brethren ye have been called unto liberty Amen. it was for freedom galatians 5 1 that christ made us free that's why he made us free is for the purpose of freedom that's verse 1, so verse 13, Brethren, ye have been called unto freedom, or liberty. Only use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, which is exactly what the church does. It's exactly what she does. She says, I'm free. I'm free. And so she uses her freedom to put her into bondage, which is contrary to logic, which is contrary to good common sense, which is contrary to the word of God. In Romans 3 and verse 8, Paul resists the slanderous charge made against him. Let us do evil so good can come. Romans 3 and verse 8. Then in the little section of the end of the fifth chapter and the beginning of the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, he's dealing with it again. Romans 5.20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Not abound in the sense that we're going to have more offenses. They didn't have as many offenses as they had back in Noah's day when God had to wipe the population of the earth right off the globe. But so that it's magnified. It abounds in our sight. When God has given us a holy, righteous law and you go against it, then sin just stands out as a glaring light. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. On into the next chapter. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You see, we've got liberty now to do all things. As Paul said, we've got liberty to do all things, but all things doesn't mean sin. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Then I have given you many times 1 Corinthians 9.21. We're free from the law, but not the law of Christ, which is the word of God seen through the eyes of grace and heated in love. Then there's a very interesting verse in 1 Peter chapter 2. Very interesting verse in 1 Peter 2 and verse 16. Paul, or Peter says as free, so even Peter deals with it. I'm used to saying Paul because we've been in his epistles. So this is interesting just in itself, that Peter deals with the same thing. 
He said, you Christians live as free, as free, but not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. Hiding your sin under saying, well, I'm free in Christ, which is precisely what people do today. It's as though these verses weren't even in the Bible, because I've even had people say that. I'm talking about the teen generation that goes down to the Baptist or whatever altar and gets saved and says, now I'm free in Christ, and they'll use that excuse for their sin of some rock and roll dance. They say, now I'm free in Christ, now I'm not really sinning in what I'm doing, but whatever reason they want to give after that, it's not sin because all my sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. Well, that's going right against what Peter said. You've taken your liberty. He said be free, as free. We have to emphasize that to some people in the reverse as well. But don't use it as, you know, a cloak. That's something that you hide behind as a cloak for evil, for doing evil behind. No one can say, although they do it anyway, they can't from the word of God, say, well, I'm free in Christ, and that means that I'm free to do such and such, which is contrary to the word. Someone responds, but I thought he said all things are lawful. Well, he said all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive in Matthew 21:22. But do you think you could ask for the Father to al never allow the Son to return to the earth and that he would grant that to you? Well, that's part of all things. No, it's not either. Amen. It's part of just the old dead word, A-L-L, -L, but that's not what he means, though. Right, there are many different passages like that in the Bible where we say all, and we're teaching on faith, and we say all, that means all, because people say, well, he doesn't mean divine healing or something. What he means by a term like that is whatever is included in the all of Scripture. And that's one thing that's not included, saying that, well, I'm going to pray that Jesus never comes back to the earth, that there's no literal, visible, physical return of Christ. Or someone could say, well, I'm going to pray for the whole state of Washington just to be converted and baptized in the Spirit. Well, that's part of your word, A-L-L, -L, but not Matthew 21, 22, A-L-L. -L. Now, you just have to know that. You have to know that or you will not interpret the Bible properly. You'll see a verse like that and you'll jump on there and say, all things are lawful for me. See, we're coming again, full house, round circle, back to say what it does it mean over there. All things are lawful to me, but your liberty will resist your license. Your freedom in Christ will resist the tendency to be enslaved by sin. Whatever is contrary to the word of God, that's not in all. Paul is talking as a Christian, not as a lost man. Because he doesn't think of lost deeds out there. Those are lawful. He's saying all things are things that are permitted by the word of God. Or at least the things that aren't condemned by the word of God. Whether condemned in, in a stated form or just by general principle. If it's not condemned by the word of God, then it's allowed. That is, you are free to do that as a Christian. Don't get ahead of me. I'll come back and qualify that and hedge that statement a little more here in a moment as well. So all things are lawful means all things that are in line with the Word of God. Now let me give you another illustration uh, that will tie into a recent message over in Galatians chapter 1 where we said that obviously, 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 I shouldn't even have to say this. It bores me to have to say it. But some people don't know anything. They just jump in the Bible and don't know what's going on. They drown in the water of the Word. Obviously, there are many passages of Scripture that you can't just take literally. Now, we are literalists, and we'll fight you tooth and nail over that, the literal interpretation of the Word of God. But we don't believe that Jesus is a shepherd or that I'm some sheep. Obviously, I'm not a sheep standing up here, or I'd be buying instead of talking in the English language. So I don't believe that I'm a sheep, but I believe that I am a sheep the way the Bible means that. He's not the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's not a lion with a long tail and a big mane. He's not the door into the kingdom that you knock on and there's a door handle and you push the button down, there's an old splintery door and you open up and go in. <coughs> you know, some of the early writers in, in Christianity got confused about all types of things like that, trying to figure out now, you know, what does he look like? A lion or a door or the root of the stem of Jesse? How are you going to look like all those in one? The star of Jacob from over in the book of Numbers, a star, he calls himself the bright and morning star. But all those things are getting across spiritual truths to us. So I said sometimes you can speak by either that method or just by exaggeration. We, remember we dealt with Matthew 5, 48. 
in Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, people say, well, of course, he's not giving us a case example in Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 when he says it's impossible. He's just warning us to stay on guard. But if we do fall away, obviously we can't fall all the way away or that's contrary to the rest of the word of God. So Galatians 1, let me give you an example. What are you going to do with verse 8? You taking the time to read it or I need to start preaching from it or what? Galatians 1 and verse 8. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul's not meaning to assume that he or an angel is ever going to preach any other gospel. He's trying to prove a point and so he kind of stretches things to make you see what he wants you to see, obviously. He's not referring to demons here. He's referring to God's angels, an angel from heaven, an angel that God sent down from heaven. If he preached any other gospel, well, you see, you're stating something that could never be true anyway. If an angel did, if after they'd gone all the way Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 and fall away, and remember I said some people interpret that passage in Hebrews 6 to mean that that never could happen. And so you can't just run through there and say, well, then why is it there? Be as perfect as your Father in heaven is? Well, we know we could never do that. But that doesn't mean just run out and throw that verse out of the Bible, though. There must be something true about the verse. Maybe not the face value, if you want to use that word. The face value view of the verse is not true. The face value of this is not true. Paul is not going to come and preach another gospel than the one he's already preached. He says, but if I do, let me be a curse. But he's not going to is the point, though. He's stretching the point to prove a point. And he goes on preaching the same thing in verse 9. Well, he says in verses 11 and 12 that he got his gospel directly from heaven. Same heaven that the angel would come from in verse 8. But no angel is going to come and preach any other gospel. He got it by Jesus Christ, and Paul's not going to turn around and preach something else. We know others have done things like that, but not the Apostle Paul. What I want to do next is return to the verse in 1 Corinthians 6, and notice the two stipulations. Really, we could raise two questions based on the last two statements that Paul makes. Each time after he says, all things are lawful unto me, he doesn't put a period there. He says, but. Purposefully, we harped on all things are lawful because that is Christian liberty. And then we're going to begin to give you some examples, hopefully here in a moment. And you'll see what I mean by the fact that all things are lawful. Number one, he says that. Number two, all things are lawful. But notice after each one, comma, but, but. So here's what we get. All things are lawful unto me, but is it necessary? Now, we're not talking about sin here. You see, we're going a little bit beyond that. We're still under that negatively stated purpose that our liberty is not for sin. But we're not talking about sin. Nothing that is sin is lawful for the Christian. The Bible would be a confused muddle. If it said that all things are lawful, including sin. No, we just scratch that off. We're Christians, so we don't talk about things like that. But what about some of these other things that are not stated to be sin? They're not implied to be sin. In the word of God, that questions can be raised about, such as what he's going to go on to talk about there in verse 13. Meats for the belly, the belly's for meat, but God will destroy both of them. There's nothing wrong with meat. Nothing wrong with eating meat or not eating meat. But is it necessary to have whatever your position is? That I can't eat this meat because of whatever reason that you have, or I must eat this meat because it's from a holy bird or for a, from a holy animal? He said meats are nothing. It's not, you see, you could abstain from meats, and that's not sin. You may have some reason that you want to, to help your digestive system get back on track after some disease that you had. You eat cornflakes for the next week. I don't know, for whatever reason a person may choose. Now, if it's for a religious reason, you see, we'll get over in 1 Timothy 4, then you've got a demonic doctrine that has attached itself to you. And a lot of people will have that doctrine and say that they are doing what they're doing for some other reason. Oh, I'm just doing it for health considerations. 
but put them in a place where the only thing they have to eat is meat, they still won't eat it. I say, but wait a minute, something's wrong with you then. You see, here's one of these distinctions that we can draw that as soon as we say it, I can see the light come on in your eyes and oh, I know what you're talking about now. Oh, I can see why it wouldn't be wrong to abstain from meat. It wouldn't be wrong to eat meat. Paul says it's neither way. We're talking now about things that are not spelled out to be sin from the Bible. And I'm saying that some people can have these various things. Like the Bible doesn't say it's sin not to come to church twice out of the year. Now that's sin if you do that. If you abstain from coming to church, that's sin. But again, you can find people that are bound up in their mind and their attitudes that have perverted views of whether they should be here or not be here or read their Bible or not read their Bible or pray or not pray. They're bound up. Their heart's not in it at all, but they're bound up in their mind with their little weak, defiled, seared conscience that they have, and that's going to become sin for them. And that's why I always say you have to resist any imposition of any law upon you if it's some religious law that you are bound to do you have to resist that, and the best way to resist it is do just the opposite. If you feel bound by a legalism to read your Bible, then don't read it tomorrow. Now, remember, we're talking about all things are lawful for the Christian. But is it necessary to have to read your Bible every day or every moment of the day? No, the Bible never teaches that. If you don't have a love for the Word, you're sinning anyway. <laughs> You're already missing the mark if you don't have a love for the Word. And what will happen to a person like that? Well, you're going to get deeper and deeper in bondage if you keep these laws over yourself. See, I might have my own little personal laws that I'm going to read so many pages out of such and such book per day, but that's not for some religious bondage reason, though, because obviously there are times I miss that. You hear some people that work just like a clock, they never miss anything and they really feel bad if they do, you've got a problem then. You've got a problem. If you've got such a tight schedule that there are no interruptions, your schedule's too tight then. <laughs> because what if the rapture happens then? Well, wait till I finish reading. <laughs> got some things to do here. I'd feel bound. Fine, fine. We're back to the fine, fine, fine line of being bound or being too free. So anyway, we're asking the question here to begin with, is it necessary? Is it necessary? Is it expedient? Then secondly, will it enslave? That means you could do something that is neither right nor wrong. But if it enslaves, it becomes wrong to you. It's not for me. I could do the same thing. But if it enslaves, it becomes wrong. Notice the end of the verse. But I will not be brought under the power of any. He said all things are lawful, but if Paul found something that was lawful for him to do, but that in doing it, somehow he got enslaved to that, then you abstain from that because that has become sin to you. Delicate distinctions, but it's the topic of Christian liberty. That's why there's nothing wrong in itself in collecting coins or postage stamps. Nothing wrong with that. We're going to be pointing out various illustrations that come to mind, and you can think of so many more, but you need to remember these things in your own life. There's nothing wrong with that. Because you'll find one Christian judging another Christian for what they're doing just because you would feel bound if you got into something like that. There are various little hobbies that we probably all have. I don't have those anymore, but I have some other hobbies that I do that maybe someone else couldn't be involved in something like that. We've even talked about just regular old physical things of hunting and fishing out there. I remember teaching a message. I think we were meeting in our home at that time where I said, if you don't already have things right in your own life, in your own heart, your priorities are right, you just soon lock yourself in your room and throw away the key because you will use things that will enslave you. And there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. But I believe we can all testify in our past life to various things that we did in themselves. There was nothing wrong, but we, came in, we became enslaved to that, whether it's collecting something or whatever it is that you like to do. Women like to go around shopping. You can become enslaved to shopping all the time, finding a bargain over here, hitting every garage sale that comes around, 
And you watch people, and, and I'll tell you what, I'm not making, you know, light of something. This is something very important. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, people can just about, well, they can end up in the hospital, end up in the grave because they missed a carport sale. Mm -hmm. That was on my list. So many people get bound up to so many different things that they just have to do. They have to do. Well, is it expedient for you to do that? Is it necessary for you to do that? Well, you've got a problem there. Or we can say, is that going to enslave you in doing that? Eating certain types of foods, not eating certain types of foods? <coughs> oh, dear friends, that's not something Old or New Testament. That's today in American culture. That's today. In Christianity, that's today in this church. Mm -hmm. Eating or not eating certain, certain things and judging your brother or your sister by what they eat or by what they don't eat. The next verse reads, meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. It makes no difference. As far as the physical food itself, to eat a candy bar, is there sin in that chocolate or that peanut or that caramel that was put in? There's no sin in that. Amen. Can it become sin to someone? It sure could. Amen. It surely could. Oh, there's so many distinctions. Because then you say, well, now beer. There's nothing wrong with the, with the, the um, cereal that goes into that and the water that goes into that. And then I could drink it and not become drunk and buy that. And therefore, it wouldn't be sin for me. <laughs> Let's talk about the subject of dress for a moment. And maybe we can make some clear distinctions. We're talking about things necessary, things that will enslave. When it comes to this subject of dress, and we're, we're, speaking, we're not talking in Africa, we're talking right here in the good old U.S. of A, or the bad old U.S. of A, which is more closer to the truth, I guess. We're talking to people here so we know what the trends and the fads and the things are out there, so forth in the world. Is there anything wrong with wearing a pink Izod shirt? No, there's nothing wrong with that. We can't bind anybody with wearing a shirt that's pink that has an Izod on it. Is there anything wrong with wearing top siders with a man wearing top siders? I guess you could wear spike boots or athletic cleats or army boots or whatever you wanted to wear. I don't think that makes any difference. Where is the verse for that in the Bible? It says that it's going to be wrong to wear army boots are wrong to wear penny loafers. <laughs> is there anything <laughs> sinful? Let me ask you this. Is there anything sinful in the slit in so many of these skirts that women wear? You can hardly buy a skirt in the store today that isn't slit up to your navel. <laughs> is there anything wrong in that slit? No, just a pair of scissors or some machine cut the slit in the skirt. Is there anything wrong with a Christian wearing that? Maybe not. Do you not realize that there could be some old fuddy-duddy old lady who doesn't even know the purpose of that slit like the fashion designers know and like we who are young know what the purpose of that slit is. She could wear that, not think anything of it, not mean anything by that. I don't see any problem with that then. But listen, dear friend, you see, we're talking about dress. It all depends on the reason that you use to make your decisions. You see, I find that too many people are using wrong reasons and that makes their decisions wrong then. Now, if I were a woman, I would not wear a skirt with a slit in it. But I wouldn't say that's a sin for a person to do that. But I want to tell you, you probably have some reasons in the back of your mind why you do that, you young women, whoever you are. And I've seen it right here in this church before. These little skirts with slits up the sides or slits up the front and the back, that looks seductive to me. And why is it that old fuddy-duddy women don't wear things like that? Why is it little teenage girls like to wear things like that? You see, I think there's some other reason behind that. The literal skirt, there's nothing wrong with it. You wearing the skirt just as a person, and your piece of clay is all you are anyway. There's nothing wrong with that. But maybe you're testifying, identifying to the world and with the world in an unnecessary fashion and manner. And that will become sin for you. Yes, it will, too. Let me give you some personal testimonies I said that I would give you. Personally, when I was growing up in high school and especially in college, the thing for all the little preppy college men to wear were either top siders or penny loafers, khaki pants, and pink Izod shirts. Is there anything wrong with that? I don't see anything wrong with that. 
You cannot legislate from the Bible what type of shirt or whatever can or can't be worn. That immediately becomes a legalism. But the, who I was, where I was, the environment, what that testified to, that testified to the fact that I'm not a Christian. I'm not different than any of you other people. I'm just a preppy college boy like the rest of you. Therefore, I chose with my liberty not to use the liberty that I had. Paul said all things are lawful, but is it necessary to use your liberty all the time? Am I coming through to you? Amen. That's why I will not wear penny loafers. To this day, I won't wear them. I'll tell you something else. All through college, I would never wear a button-down shirt. Now, if you've noticed some of my shirts lately, it's only been the last year that I bought any button-down shirts. Why? That was the end thing, the cool thing to do. That makes all the sense in the world to me. I have the liberty, too, to wear whatever type of clothing I want to wear, assuming that it covers my body. You see, we're not talking about something sin. Going around with no top on and for a woman is sin. That's sin. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about what we're talking about. I chose not to wear any of these neat little cotton shirts with button-down collars on them. I despise the old things. <laughs> Why? It's because that's what everyone did to be cool. You wore that or either your pink Izod pullover shirt and your khaki pants and your penny loafers. Now, I just don't like penny loafers. I think they look sissified, to tell you the truth. But I don't see a problem with you wearing them, but it all depends on why. You see, as soon as you give someone the liberty to, a young 20-year-old, he'll do it because it's the cool thing to do, but he'll use his liberty as an excuse. Amen. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Amen. We saw that in 1 Peter 2.16. Don't use your liberty as an excuse to sin. Oh, brother, I thought you said it wasn't a sin to wear. Not for me, but it is for you. <laughs> that's right. Why? Because you want to look cool in the eyes of the world. And then, you know, someone can say, well, you know, well, why do you wear that type of tie? Because that's what maybe a businessman wears and you're identifying with him. Well, you got to wear something, that's for sure. And you're certainly not going to, in the Bible, find any place where Christians wear a certain type of garb, namely a white robe and gold sandals. You're not going to find that in the New Testament. You've got to wear something. Glorified. But, <laughs> but, you know, no one thinks anything when you wear regular clothes that look like a businessman. No one thinks anything about that. So, you've got, again, you've got to follow the train of thought that we're teaching in here. If you're a young woman and you wear these little tight skirts and with these little slits in them and these low-cut blouses, I think you're doing it for a reason, even though you might lie through your teeth up one side of the wall and down the other, but I'm not doing it for that. I, I don't care about anybody lusting after me. I'm not trying to call attention to myself. You old filthy liar. Yes, you are, too. So why not just avoid the, the appearance of evil then? Just avoid it. I didn't say it was evil. I said the appearance of it. There's nothing wrong with a slit in the skirt. And, and let me tell you something else. Because here is where I'll show you that I'm in liberty and someone else is in bondage. We talked about meat a moment ago. Someone will say, oh, I'm free to eat meat, but I've chosen not to. And then you put them somewhere where they're starving. They still won't eat meat. Then they're bound. If I was in a place, the only thing I could buy was a dress with a slit in it, and I had some necessary reason for that, then so what? I choose that then. I'm not bound by that. This is what we're talking about. This is the meat of the doctrine that we're getting into. That all things are lawful, but things aren't necessarily expedient for you, for that person, for that time, for that situation, for that environment. Amen. Little children will be brought up the same way to wear the same little cool things that people do at school. I don't see, you see, you wear some shirt that has one of the Dukes of Hazard on it. Just that literal imprint on there, there's nothing sinful about that. That's not sin, it's just cotton, it's just cloth. But you're testifying to something that's not Christian, though. That's what I'm saying. Any of these little clothes with these little worldly TV slogans and pictures and idols on it, for a Christian, that's going to become sin for you. There's nothing wrong with it. You could use it as a dirty laundry rag or something, and you don't have to burn it as occult or something. There's nothing wrong with that. Use it for a dirty laundry rag. Use it as a dust rag or whatever. You know, people are getting bound up with so many different things. And this dress thing, it doesn't just apply to the young people, but primarily to them. Primarily to whatever ages you want from, say, 10 to, well, up to 30. 
because even the 30 years old, even the 35, want their top siders, bottom siders, upside downers, whatever you call them, penny loafers, and stick a little dime or penny in there, and hey, hey, we're cool, and wear your white socks and your pants rolled up at the bottom, and all this strange stuff to look like everyone else out there. There's a certain way you've got to be discerning enough to know, and if you're dressing like that, you must be discerning enough you caught it from your peers. That's where you got it from. You weren't born knowing how to flip the bottom of your blue jeans up to look cool. You did that because you saw someone else do that. And it's not just because it's kind of a nice way to wear them. That becomes cliquish for you. I might see the way someone else tied their tie and think that's a good way to do it. I'm not comping them to be cliquish. It's just smart. But you watch the way some people turn the bottom of their blue jeans up. They flip them up, two flips, because that's the way people do it. Then I say you're wrong for doing that. I'm going to do just the opposite from that. <laughs> All types of snickers go on when you talk about things like this. People will snicker about everything thinking, now, what's in my wardrobe at home? Because you see, what we're trying to give you is the right Christian doctrine with the right reasons behind it. Amen. Let's come to this sodomite shoe thing. There are wrong reasons behind that, and that has been made into a legalism and a bondage in, in a certain church, many churches from what I hear now, mm -hmm. to tell people you cannot wear a certain type of athletic shoe. Now listen, if I lived in some place in San Francisco and all my neighbors were homosexuals and they were all lost and unsaved and they all wore the same type of tennis shoe, obviously I wouldn't wear that tennis shoe. Mm -hmm. But I might wear it when I go camping, though. You see, you'll make this thing into a bondage. Listen to me, friends. I've heard it on the tapes myself. They say you've got to get them out of your closet. You can't have them. You can't use them for any reason. Why? Because it identifies you with the homosexual. No, you're wrong in your reasoning. It's too broad. It's too narrow in some regards. It's unscriptural in everything that I find wrong with something like that because you're identifying with the homosexual. We're all in favor. You don't identify unnecessarily with the world. But who knows that about tennis shoes, though? You've got to find out what environment you're in. When you're in high school, maybe there are things that you should not wear. There's nothing sinful about it. But I'm telling you, you wear it because you want to be accepted by other people around you. That's why. That is sin because you haven't found your acceptance in the Lord Jesus. That's become <laughs> sin for you, then, just the way that you dress. The Bible has a lot to say about these things. We're in this general, overall, broad passage right here. All things are lawful, but they're not always necessary or expedient. We're not talking about things sinful. You see, all these things are allowed of God. The various articles of clothing that we've talked about, they're allowed of God. But when you're in high school, I found this to be in college. Here I am, saved and overcomer, but I found that a temptation I had to resist and overcome. You don't want to look different. Everybody has on a certain type of clothing, and you kind of want to wear the same thing. That shows you there must be something to it, or why did I have to resist that and fight against that? Fight against that desire to go out and get my little shoes, my little khaki pants, comb my hair down the middle. I don't know if anybody does. I'll stop looking around. <laughs> It, see, we're not going to legislate on how you comb your hair. But why are you combing it the way that you do? It's the neat thing if you know anything. I mean, why do you comb yours the way you do? Do you just do it because that's the way you've combed it since you were a little boy? Or did you see someone in college who parted down the middle and got a hair dryer and fluffed it up? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> You're doing that for the wrong reason now. And you can't say, well, I'll deal with the reason, but I'm not going to change my haircut. No. <laughs> You're probably going to miss it right there. <laughs> That's right. I just saw it happen back in my high school days. People would go home one day and come back the next day, all the boys with their hair parted down the middle. It wouldn't even stay, you know, because they'd combed it regularly for years. Like a good Sunday school boy, you comb it to the left or the right, one or the other. Or if you're real small, you just put a bowl on your hair and cut all around that, like a little Bo Peep or something. But they'll go home one day and come back and it's standing straight up. Trying to get it parted down the middle to be, hey, cool, and they run their fingers through their hair this way and always bobbing their head like a duck. <laughs> oh, so I'm not going to do that because I don't want to be identified as a little 21-year-old who just like everyone else. 
Amen. Now, if you've got hair like a wire brush, you don't have to be concerned, I don't guess. Just <laughs> let it grow straight up. <laughs> Although I had an acquaintance who had wire hair, and he had it with, I saw it one time with clips in it to hold it down to get it parted down the middle. <laughs> you look like some old woman off a soap opera with all those things in your hair, you know. Because it was just like a wire brush, you know. But he wanted to have that part down the middle because everybody parts their hair down the middle. <laughs> Girls go through a Farrah Fawcett stage and all of us get it cut and look like a sheepdog and be real cool. Look like her or maybe I shouldn't use names on tapes, but you know, some actress will come along and everybody will copy them. Obviously, we ought to know as a Christian that's wrong. Now, if you just happened to have had your hair like that all the time anyway, and then it happened, they overtook you, still, you may need to consider, what am I testifying to to the world out there? See, obviously, you know there's nothing wrong with you and your heart. Are you free to do that? You certainly are. You had your hair combed that way anyway, and then everyone else started copying you. <laughs> but he said, just because you're free to do that, is it necessary? Is it expedient? See, we're just dealing with one subject now, and that's the subject of clothing, because it can be an explosive subject, and the sodomite shoe doctrine is a good thing. Mm -hmm. To make that a doctrine, that's wrong. That is sinful to make that sinful. Amen. <laughs> because we just read all things are lawful. Anything that's not spelled out as sin in the Bible, you know, like adultery and lying and stealing, all that is spelled out as sin. That's not lawful to you. But what type of clothing to wear? Now, the Bible says be sure that you're clothed. If you didn't have any clothes, that's a sin. Be sure that you're clothed. But what type of clothing? Different cultures are going to wear different type of clothing. As long as what you have on, what you do or don't do, is not violating either something stated explicitly in the Bible or some principle in the Bible. Hey, listen about this thing about men and women and pants and things. In Israel, when verses like that were written, they all wore robes. What do you mean a woman can't wear a pair of pants because the Bible forbids that? She can't dress like a man. They all wore robes in the Bible. Men didn't wear pants in the Bible. We'll deal with that later and explain some of that again to you, but they all wore robes. See, we got all these brilliant, educated idiots out there who just talk and talk and talk and have some neat little doctrine and don't have any good biblical reasons behind it. Sodomite shoes, you're identifying with homosexuals. Well, if you use the King James Version, he was a homosexual. King James was, so you're identifying with homosexuality then. Uh-oh, look at all the Bibles. Close up and go under the seat now. <laughs> sure, you don't know that. Read English history. It came after Elizabeth. King James, he was a homosexual. So we're using a homosexual's Bible here. But nobody knows he was, so let's don't tell him about it then. <laughs> See, most people don't know that, so you're not identifying to anything. If the whole world just made a big deal about him being homosexual, I guess would give his version up then, or at least would call it by some other name than King James. They keep using a homosexual's name. Every time you use that, you're using a homosexual's name. <laughs> But every time we use Judas' name, we're using some old apostate's name. That's not sinful in itself, though. Sodomite shoe doctrine, that is a doctrine of a demon. I'll be the first, the middle, and the last to say that. When you make that a doctrine, that is a doctrine of a demon. If I made it into a doctrine, you couldn't wear a pink shirt with an eyes on, that's a doctrine of a demon. All things are lawful to those of us who have Christian liberty. All things are lawful to us. All things. We're not talking about sin. That's not at all. All things are lawful. That's whatever type of clothing you want to wear. For the continuation of the...